as I mentioned, I'm Damien. Um, my handle online is generally Damien Stanton, where you can find me everywhere. Um, I already mentioned uh, Signal Frame. Uh, so what we do uh, is we're an IoT analytics uh, startup. And right now our focus is actually on uh, helping enterprise uh, customers build automatic contract contact tracing solutions uh, during the COVID pandemic. Um, but we also use our technology to um, do asset tracking and some other just general graph analytics. So uh, I call this I call this little chat really I don't think of it as much of a presentation or a talk as, as just a, a discussion. Um, but I call it give and take uh, because the unique thing about REST memory management system is the concept of uh, ownership and borrowing and lifetimes. And uh, hopefully by the end of it, you'll understand what all those words mean. Um, I don't have very many slides in the slide deck. Uh, the bulk of what I wanna do is to look at uh, chapter five of the Tour of Rust, which is a really great website. Um, if you're familiar with Golang, you know the Go Tour is kind of the introduction to how most people learn the language uh, as a real nice step-by-step -step, uh, procedural way to get the mental model in, in your head. Um, and Tour of Rust really does the same thing for Rust. Um, I'm just gonna be looking at the chapter on ownership and borrowing because it really, has a nice walkthrough of what these concepts are. Um, and as I'm going through and, and basically just reading along and looking at the code, uh, if you have any questions or you want me to try something out and say, well, what would happen if you did this? Uh, that'd be great because that's a, it's a nice way to kind of interactively look at it. So just as a primer, um, we're probably all familiar with uh, the stack and the heap in terms of the, how processes manage memory. Um, in case you're not, uh, the stack is genera generally a, a last in first out data structure um, and it frames data, data locally to um, sort of the call tree of a given function. So you define a function and you have some variables in it. Those values are assigned to um, the stack that is local to that function. If the size can be known at compile time, and this is different in different languages. Like I said, this is a very high level overview. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the semantics or pedantics of any language in particular, um, but just so you're aware of, of these uh, concepts. Uh, is anyone not familiar with the stack and heap or what a pointer means when I say I have a value on the stack that points to something on the heap? Is everyone familiar with those concepts? Um, can you give a little bit of a brief, a brief primer? <laughs> uh, sure, sure. So. Um, so, and this might make sense with the next couple of slides. Um, but so basically, um, uh, any program that you run needs a way to manage its memory. Um, and there's typically a, sort of a quick, fast access memory and a slower access memory. You can sort of think of an analogy to the way that um, a traditional computer might have a very fast, um, uh, you know, very fast high bandwidth RAM, uh, random access memory, and then you might have a comparatively slower SSD, which is like your persistent storage. It's loosely similar, maybe, um, thinking about the stack and the heap. So the stack, uh, because it's the location of the last thing on the stack is always known, it's always the top thing. Um, it's much quicker to access. Um, and the stack has a known size. So only elements that are smaller than a certain size will fit in the stack. Um, whereas the heap is a little bit more complicated. It's generally a, a bigger tree-like structure, which is why the diagram looks like this. Um, and if you want to put something on the heap, a lot of bookkeeping has to happen. And the memory allocator you know, program that acts as a part of your compiler needs to understand how to go find a space in the heap, mark that as being for your particular piece of data that you want, and then do all the shuffling to make sure that um, you know, there's no memory corruption. So, uh, and, and what a pointer is in terms of, you know, this discussion of memory management is you have a value on the stack that references directly a value on the heap. And so if, in this example, if C is, if I have a pointer to C, um, I can reference the value of C in my particular function, whatever I'm doing to it. But when I change the pointer to C, that actually changes the value of C in the heap. Um, and we won't talk too much about the, stack versus heap in Rust. Um, it's actually kind of unique in that uh, Rust explicitly forces you to tell the compiler when you're putting something on heap, which is not really like other languages, uh, even C++. But um, I think the only important distinction is just to know kind of what pointers are. 
uh, and what references are, because that's uh, that's sort of key to part of the ownership model in Rust is that uh, references sort of have some unique rules and um, values have some unique uh, kind of semantics around them uh, that that make it um, that make it work the way that it does. So does that make sense? Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Sure. Uh, and this is I love this this uh, this GIF. Uh, this is kind of this is the canonical Java example. Uh, but when I say references versus values, um, so you can imagine, uh, say here that uh, the cup might be a heap allocated object in memory. Um, when that when that object is changing, if another place in your program has a reference to that, uh, those will sort of work in lockstep because it's actually referring to, in the case of C++, for example, it's referring to a specific address in memory. Um, so, so you can know that when you're referring to something, you're actually like, you're just looking at a pointer to another thing. And that's, that's what these terms reference and pointer really mean. They're, they're just very direct. Um, whereas in Java, for example, when you pass something by a value, you actually create a new object. Um, Rust's memory management system is unique in that, uh, when you do something like pass by value, it's not in the animation, but you can imagine that in Rust, the cup would actually be given to the fill cup function. Um, it's called move semantics. Uh, and we'll see that a little bit in the, in the sort of walk through the tour. Uh, but essentially, um, th that's a key point is that uh, Rust enforces move semantics and it enforces the concept of ownership, which we'll understand when we look at the, um, look at the tour. So just as kind of to wrap up the primer, um, what it looks like in practice to actually use uh, values and references. Um, I'll start with a Java example because Java doesn't allow access to to pointers. Um, pointers do exist in Java, of course. If you've written any non-trivial amount of Java before, you've definitely run into a null pointer exception error. Um, and that is because you've tried to access something uh, typically that references some other object on the heap. Um, and maybe it wasn't initialized correctly, or maybe um, it got mutated in a way that you didn't know about or something. Uh, but generally, that, that's uh, one of the pitfalls of Java is that uh, when things are null or uninitialized, or they, you, know, you have a reference that you're not really aware of because you don't have access to pointers, um, you might run into problems. And comparatively, when you look at Go, which is sort of maybe a next step down the ladder towards manual mem memory management, uh, you do have access to pointers. So there is a semantic difference between when I'm passing in here a person versus when I'm passing in a pointer to person. Um, here, for example, I know that I'm explicitly allocating uh, because uh, I'm passing in a pointer to something that exists on heap. And then if we look at C++, um, it's more or less the same thing as Go. Um, when we look at the tour, I'll talk a little bit about um, move semantics in C++. I think a lot of the current standards in C++ have been updated to reflect some of the same ideas that you might see in Rust. Um, but as someone else mentioned, Rust is a very powerful type system and it's, uh, it's a little bit different. So the concepts of like move semantics and resource uh, acquisition is initialization, which you'll see that acronym here. Um, I'll talk really briefly about that. Um, those concepts are pretty well tied together. Um, and this is all just to say that uh, the memory management system in Rust, even though it's very unlike C++, that's probably where it's uh, most closely related uh, as opposed to like Go or Java or Python or something like that. Um, Another uh, language ecosystem that is somewhat similar, it might be Swift if you do any iOS development. Um, Swift does allow you to access raw pointers, um, but it also has a distinction about whether values uh, exist or not. Uh, its memory management system is different. It is garbage collected. Uh, so I won't speak about that, but uh, that is just uh, something to keep in mind is that um, you don't wanna be thinking about sort of uh, a garbage collected system that does all the work for you. Rust is a little bit closer to C++ in terms of, um, you have to think about the lifetimes and scopes of things and how long something exists for, which you'll understand when we look at the tour. Um, 
So it's, it's uh, like I said, it's a third path. It's not exactly uh, ma manual memory management, but it's also not garbage collected. Uh, and we'll see how that works as we go through the tour. So let's see, uh, do you all see the tour of rust? And uh, there's the crab here. Yeah. Yeah, it looks good. Great. Okay. Um, and how is the text size? I don't know if, if this is a uh, too small or or should I make it larger? You could expand it a little bit, maybe. Sure. How's that? Looks good. Looks good. Okay. Great. So, uh, so this key concept. The first thing. What is ownership? So. Um, this is, it's kind of, it's a tautological almost to say, okay, well, instantiating a type and binding to a variable creates a memory resource and the bound variable is called the resources owner. Okay. So foo is the owner of this data structure. We don't really know what that means yet, but it'll make sense as, as we go along. But that's the first thing to, to say. So when we create a data structure, it's bound to a variable. That variable owns that piece of data in memory. And so what uh, resource acquisition is initialization is, and this is a concept that was um, sort of pushed forward in the C++ community uh, because people would constantly, if you've ever written C++, you probably run into segmentation fault issues um, or you've had a problem uh, such as a dangling pointer, which is where, uh, so we talked about having a value on the stack that points to something on the heap. Uh, you could very well imagine that in a C++ function, you could reference a value that's on the heap, uh, do some operation that fails, and then that function returns um, before that pointer was able to be deallocated. Um, or, or, well, more correctly to say, before that pointer is able to be destroyed or dropped, this, this concept of dropping. Um, and this can actually lead to really severe security vulnerabilities. Um, I can't remember the CVE number, but there was a very well-known uh, memory bug in Internet Explorer version six all the way through 11 um, that was caused basically because of a, a dangling pointer where a pointer to a place in memory was not properly cleaned up uh, because it, in C++ it's, it's manual. Um, this was not properly cleaned up and that pointer pointed to an address in memory that later on an attacker was able to just say, hey, there's a pointer here that goes to a place in memory what happens if I access, read that memory, and maybe I can figure out how to execute code there. So it's a, it's a real issue. Um, and uh, this concept of RAI basically says, okay, well, if we can build uh, classes and functions and data structures that explicitly describe sort of the scope of how long something is supposed to exist for, uh, then we know that it's gonna be dropped. Um, and there's some examples in uh, sort of the canonical C++ um, reference website is cppreference.com. If you look there on this topic of RAII, uh, the example they give is like a, um, a mutex. So if you've ever uh, written C or Go, um, you know that a mutex is used to sort of say, I want to lock access to, like say I have a bunch of threads who are looking at a piece of data. I'm going to lock access to it. Um, the example they give in this uh, RAI uh, tutorial is to say, well, if you do it manually and you say lock and then do something, you might accidentally return the function or go do something else before the lock is released. And then that's, that's a dangling pointer. So our AI basically says, well, if you use a different function that has like a safe, like a safe mutex that will always drop, uh, it's any, anything that it's locking, it'll always release the lock as soon as it goes out of scope, then that can't happen. And it sort of obviates that issue. Um, now in C++, uh, these, this is all done by hand. So you have to use a particular class or use a particular function or method that is sort of designed by the programmer to, to implement and enforce RAI. Um, and that's why people say that it's a programming paradigm or you know, style. It's not really a, uh, it's not something that's enforceable other than by maybe a very smart compiler or just programming practices. So uh, one thing that Rust does is that it enforces our AI. Um, when things go out of scope, they are always dropped. And this dropping is hierarchical. So what that means is that 
here and this example is pretty self-explanatory uh, when you have a data structure that contains another data structure um, when that first one goes out of scope it gets uh, it gets dropped first and then it's sort of interior piece of data gets dropped and there's sort of a drop like a, a in C++ these would be destructor calls uh, these, it's sort of a chain of, of dropping um, and these resources can only be dropped once uh, and this is important because another uh, sort of classic C memory management issue that programmers run into is say you um, say if you're using this plain C uh, and you create a piece of data you allocate the memory using malloc function you do the right thing you free the memory when you're done but then you forget that you freed it and then you try to free it again later um, that's also uh, an error so this is another thing that the rest compiler does uh, to enforce this idea is that uh, when things are destructed that can only happen once and you can actually you can write a lot of this sort of scope managed um, the uh, dropping of memory that's gone out of scope is done automatically and the implementations are actually uh, the compiler is smart enough to be able to understand how to implement a uh, drop for like for example foo and bar because this is just a primitive type it's very simple but if you had a really complex type um, you could implement drop yourself just like you would in c++ with a destructor uh, you could just say okay well when i want the um when i want to release the memory here's how i want it to happen okay so here is what i meant when i talked about move semantics so if you think about the coffee cup analogy rather than so in that uh in that c plus plus example if i uh, pass in uh, a particular uh, instance of a class for say um that value actually gets copied so that in c plus plus you'd say it's copy constructor gets called um and the same thing occurs in, in java you you uh when you pass a, a piece of data by value the whole piece of data gets copied now in rust that's not the case when you pass data around in rust uh, unless you're passing a reference and we'll understand what references are in a bit uh, the data is explicitly moved so the ownership transfers from place a to place b so this is a uh, best understood in the code so say we have this fo uh, foo object here uh, we pass it in to do something and do something just prints it but what happens is in the main call stack when we pass something to foo if we tried to use foo after this it would not work you would get a uh, value cannot be used after move error by the compiler and it would actually it's smart enough to tell you okay well the data moved here and uh, this isn't uh, it doesn't impact you so much when you're looking at something extremely trivial like this um, but it's very important when you talk about um, multi-threaded programming in rust or uh, you talk about async and, and doing uh, computations that use sort of higher level abstractions than threads directly um, it's very important because uh, data tracking the movement of data is a key to how the memory management system works and as i mentioned here so when the owner's value is copied to the function call parameter stack memory so if i have a function here that returns a value and i pass it to another thing if i'm not passing a reference and i'm passing the real foo then that data actually moves that's an important thing to understand now in c plus plus there is a function to do this it's called standard move and you call move on an object and you can actually tell it to do this um, in rust this is a part of the way the compiler works so um, again it's it's sort of it's the same idea where in c plus plus you would have to sort of opt in to do this whereas in rust it's a part of the compiler it's a part of the syntax of the language Damien, I'm going to jump in here. It looks like we've got a couple of questions in the chat box. Oh, sure. um, Ying, do you want to just go ahead and actually ask yours? Is that easier? Yes, unfortunately, I can't see the chat right now. Um, oh, yeah, no worries. That's why I figured as you're transitioning. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Feel, feel free to stop me anytime. Uh, anytime, like, if something doesn't make sense, please just shout out and say, hey, wait, what is that? <laughs> uh, okay. I, didn't wanna, I don't want to go too fast. I didn't want to bug you. Um, so I think you were saying like before uh, that data is dropped once it gets out of scope. So is yes. writing the code in scope kind of like wrapping a 
this kind of like a wrapper around like uh, memory alloc and, and deallocation actions? Yes, it's very similar. So, um, and then scoping in Rust uh, works by way of the actual, uh, it's actually a part of the lexing in the, the language parser. So if, if you put something in curly brackets, for example, uh, this is an explicit scope. So if I tried to, um, if I tried to access, like say I defined 10 different variables in here uh, inside this particular block. If I tried to access those out here, uh, they wouldn't be valid anymore. So it is, it is like, um, it is sort of like a, a language enforced version of, um, of doing that memory management explicitly. Yeah. Cool. And the, the second question I had was, um, so for Rust, you said that you can only drop things once. Does it throw mm -hmm. an error on dropping or does it just elide the error and say you, you can't do You that? mean if, 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 uh, if something went wrong during the drop? Um, if you're dropping it twice, uh, was the thing I was imagining. Oh, no. So, um, so you, you, it would be a compiler error. You would get, you would, it would say that you couldn't like value has already been, uh, I don't know what the exact error message is. It's not value has already been dropped, but you, you wouldn't be able to do that. It's it would a, be a compile time error. It's a move error because the drop yeah. trait takes ownership of anything it's implemented on. So if you try to drop it a second time, like if you called standard mem drop, to manually drop it, that um, yeah, you, that's the error you would see. Yeah, so it's it's compiled on that runtime. Cool, thanks. Okay. Okay, so now to talk about references. Um, so this is a point of contention sometimes with uh, Go or C++ programmers because the syntax for references looks like the syntax for pointers in other languages. Um, Rust does have raw pointers, but uh, generally in Rust, all of the pointer um, semantics uh, work around what are called smart pointers. Uh, in C++, those are, those are um, look just like with move and with other operations that sort of enforce this RAI thing. Um, those are specific functions, so you call make a unique pointer or make a shared pointer or things like that. Um, in Rust, this is baked into the language. So references, um, like it says here, you can borrow access to a resource and references are dropped just like, just like other, other, other things. Um, I like that they phrase it this way to say references allow us to borrow access. Um, this is important because it's, it's sort of like saying you can't, if you're not moving ownership, if you're not taking something and becoming its owner, you can't, you can't take it, you can't have it. You, you have to borrow it, but then at some point you, you don't have ownership of that piece of data anymore. So you just borrow, and that's what, why it's called borrowing. You just have the reference for, to this thing for a particular lifetime. And um, there, there are a couple sections on lifetimes later. Um, so that's like kind of kind of the, th the three, the three things that hold up the REST memory management system are um, the concept of ownership, so how data moves around in terms of move semantics, um, uh, references for how, like when you reference something, how does the compiler understand how long that reference should be valid for? It's, a, it's an interesting question that, that comes up a lot um, in multi-threaded and concurrent programming. And then the third piece is, okay, so when I say when you, you have ownership, you have references to it, and then, okay, so how long does that, does the borrow, how long does that reference live for? Um, uh, one so, question I had for, yep. for that section was that uh, for, for smart references or smart pointers, do you have only like certain limited permissions on what you can do with that data? Like, is it only read only, or uh, do you also have the ability to write? That is, that is a great question. Uh, you basically have asked the question that is answered by this next slide. Oh. which is, um, so Rust, uh, a little bit like Swift uh, or other, other languages where, where you have to define the mutability of an object explicitly when you declare it. So like if I, if this, if foo was not mute, I could not take a mutable reference to it. And I also wouldn't be able to change foo later. So like if I tried to say foo.x is 99, that would be a compile error because foo is not declared as mutable. So in Rust, you have to declare any time a value is able to be changed. And likewise, when you take a reference to uh, a mutable thing, uh, that, that holds true there as well. So you have to assign, you, you have to tell the compiler explicitly whenever data is mutable. 
I don't know if that answers that question directly, but but yes. So it's kind of like const let or var val kind of syntax. Exactly. Yeah. So instead of let, like let is always immutable. Let mute is mutable. Cool. Sounds great. Yep. Yeah, and this is interesting. This is an interesting piece of code to kind of step through. So do something prints the value here, but do something takes a foo. It does not take a reference to foo. So do something consumes the value. It takes ownership of it. So if you do, so you gave out, so foo exists. You kind of have it up here in space. Uh, you created f, which is immutable reference to foo. So now anybody who wants to do something with f, that reference will point back to foo on the heap. If you tried to pass the original object foo to something else, that's a compile time error because the compiler isn't gonna let you move a piece of data that has a mutable reference to it out there somewhere. And this is super helpful when you have, uh, you know, potentially like you're doing multi-threaded programming and you may be having like a, a, a wide dispersal of references to a particular data type, uh, you, you don't want to allow that piece of data to move around in unexpected ways. Um, what I just said doesn't, doesn't really work semantically because there, there's uh, the way that references work as far as multi-threading, they're, they're not allowed to be shared. They're like, there are special types in Rust called um, interior types that allow interior mutability, but that's, uh, that's kind of getting, getting way ahead and it's not really useful for, for this discussion. Um, but just to suffice to say that uh, it, it's really, really helpful to have the, uh, to have a difference between um, a, a reference and potentially mutable reference to an object and the actual object and to know when those can change and move. So uh, going back to the example, so do something foo is a compiler error because you can't, you can't move a piece of data when a mutable reference to it exists. Um, and also trying to modify it here, even though the piece of data was declared is mutable, because you have a mutable reference to it, the compiler wouldn't be able to know, okay, well, which, how, how does it know which, which uh, sort of which caller, if you will, is, is the correct one to change the piece of data? It doesn't work. So even though foo is mutable here, because you gave out a reference to it, um, it can't be modified uh, directly anymore. So then say, okay, you do the right thing. You go through the mutable reference, which is the safe way to access that piece of data and access its memory. You, you modify it. Now the compiler knows for the rest of this scope, you're not using F anymore. So F is dropped. So now it's, now it's gone. Now a mutable reference to foo no longer exists. So now foo is free to be mutated again. So that's kind of the crux of how this memory management system works at the most basic level. Um, in, uh, in, in C++, the function that creates the equivalent of, um, of Rust, a Rust, Rust reference is called unique pointer. And I love that, that function name because that's exactly what it is. It's a unique reference that is handed out. And when you hand it out, you can't change the original piece of data except through that reference. So until that reference goes out of scope, the, the original piece of data, even if it's mutable, is no longer accessible. And, and because you can do that at scale with all the different variables in your program, that's how the memory management system is able to work without a garbage collector. Um, the only piece that's sort of missing from how that works is lifetimes, which we'll get into in a bit. Wait, so you can't hand out arbitrary references to immutable data? You, uh, I'm not sure if I, so can't, you can't hand out muta arbitrary immutable, uh, uh immutable. Sorry, you can't hand out arbitrary references to immutable data. Like for, for mutable, I understand like handing out arbitrary references would, uh, since you might be able to, to mutate that data underneath, like it might result in, in memory safety issues, yeah. but for immutable yeah. data, um, I guess so it doesn't you, understand that part. No, no, you can. You, you, you can hand out reference. I, I was, when I was talking about uh, handing out one explicit reference, I just meant the mutable reference. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and typically, and you'll see this in, in, if you look at Rust code bases, you'll see um, often uh, functions will take a reference to a particular type rather than, 
take ownership of the type. Um, but you, you can have multiple references to an immutable piece of data. Cool. I have a question. Yep. So um, you're signing 13 to X and uh, foo. If you wanted to do uh, more to it, you could. It just drops it because it knows that there's nothing else in that scope that tries to modify it. Yeah. So let's see here. So if we run this with 13 and 7, so. And then what if you move that line to line 28? You, would you get the error um, on, the, on line 27? Uh, so here, so, yep. Okay. Yeah. And one, one thing that's very helpful with Rust compared to C++ or other, other languages is that the compiler is very, um, is very explicit about what's happening. Even if the language in the compilation error is is like confusing, um, it'll generally tell you what's happening. Um, and when we look at lifetimes, uh, I don't know if I, I don't think we'll have time to figure out something that triggers a compiled time error for lifetimes. But um, it gets very very specific. Like it'll say you declared something that had this lifetime, which doesn't live long enough for this, but it does apply to this, and it's very helpful. So. I often joke that like writing REST programs is really just getting into a debate with a compiler. And then once it agrees that you've written something that won't, you know, crash or cause a memory issue, then, then it's fine. Does, um, for, for foo, because foo is, it looks like a struct uh, of mm -hmm. sorts, is the, is the mutability or is immutability referring to like just a struct or is a struct plus values? Oh, uh, that's the struct plus value. So this, so this is, so foo here is, uh, so this, so Rust has um, struct literals, just like Go. So this is an inst this is an instance of foo. Like you've created a foo here, and you're marking that this this data structure is mutable here, through foo. Um, if it was immutable though, um, and you were modifying, would you be able to modify the value within the struct? Um, no. Within it, well, I mean, you mean during initialization or uh, after initialization? No, so so if you if like if this was not mutable, um, let's see, don't know if this will compile. See, so you'd get this error. Hmm. Can it assign to epic just behind behind uh, a shared reference? Okay. Well, no, sorry, I should say exclusive reference. Okay, I know that's the thing in Python, so. Yeah. All right. And this part's not that interesting. Um, just like with other languages, you have a dereference de operator. So you can dereference um, values that have, like if you, if you have a shared reference, you can dereference it to sort of get their value and modify it. Um, but that's just a syntactical thing. Okay, so the last piece of this, and I'm running out of time, uh, the third thing that makes the rest system work without a garbage collector is lifetimes. Um, so uh, the key point here, um, so you can have, and we, we actually saw this compiler error. So you can only have one mutable reference out at a time. You can have multiple immutable references. You can't have both. We saw that compiler error. Uh, and this is key, a reference must never live longer than its owner. Um, so a lifetime, just generically, whether you're talking about Rust or C++ or whatever, a lifetime is basically the lifetime of an object in memory starts when it comes into scope and it ends when it goes out of scope. So the data is alive in the scope and not outside of it. Uh, so this is just explaining why this is a useful concept. I'm going to skip over. So there's this piece here, you can use references of references, which is not, it's, this just gets confusing, um, but it is useful in some cases, um, but it's not important for this. So the last piece I want to talk about is explicit lifetimes. So like I said, a lifetime corresponds to um, when something comes into scope versus when it goes out of scope. Uh, the, the Rust compiler generally um, infers and elides lifetimes. So that's why we haven't seen this syntax before now. Um, the I, a way that I've heard lifetimes described that I really like 
is if you think about generics in Java, for example, or C++, um, you know that you can provide sort of annotations to describe some type that doesn't exist uh, concretely, but is sort of an abstract type. So you can say, if I want to log anything, no matter the type, I can say that the, the say in C++, you'd say the template type is T, or in Java, you'd say the generic type is T. Um, lifetimes in Rust are sort of like generics. They're like generic types, but instead of corresponding to the shape of data, they refer to how long a scope is. So you can say, so this lifetime annotation tick A is basically saying do something generically over something that exists for at least as long as A. And so when you understand it that way, and if you think about it in terms of something like a generic, it becomes much easier to understand what's happening. So you can say do something can only operate on data that lives for at least as long as A. So I take in a referenced foo, which lives for that long, and I return an integer value that also lives that long. And so when you look in the code, it's the same way. Um, you, can, uh, you can do something with the reference, and then it gets dropped later. But the lifetime annotation here is just to say, uh, whatever this piece of data foo is, it has to live for this long. And what, what this is, is just arbitrary. The, um, like the, the standard practice is to use these single letters, but I think sometimes it's more useful to say like, maybe tick foo would be better. Even though it ends up getting really noisy this way, it's sort of more semantically explicit because I'm saying, do something operates on things that live at least as long as foo and then foo has to live that same length the reference for this can't be dropped before whatever this means this lifetime foo has passed um so when you look at rust code it, it's it's best to think of this in terms of like a maybe you would call it like a temporal generic like it's a generic uh, it's a generic type over the scope of something rather than like the data type, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, what is explicit, is there, are explicit lifetimes only used for single thread code or can you also use it for, for multi-threading where you don't know when something may be or not be in scope? Uh, yes, you, you would use it. So you would use it. Um, and, and actually, I think there's, they, they don't go through multi-threading, but there are some examples of using lifetimes in data types directly. Um, so that's where, where the impact would come in. Um, but it, do, it does apply to, uh, to multi-threaded uh, or async code as well. And uh, this is just, uh, this is just sort of an extension of that where, um, this doesn't really mean anything different. It's just saying that you can have um, you can have multiple lifetimes in a particular function or a piece of data, um, and they don't have to correspond to each other necessarily. Uh, so we take a foo in here that lives for this long, and we're returning an integer that lives this long. We don't care if uh, foo a gets dropped because we only explicitly told the compiler, "I need you to guarantee." That while the function has to live for this long, of course it does because otherwise you wouldn't be able to have a, a receiver of this type of data, but the return value just has to live as long as this. So I don't care if you clean up uh, tick A foo here. Um, a third, another piece to the lifetime um, sort of methodology is static. Uh, and this is this is much simpler, I think, than than you would think. Uh, static just means uh, what you would expect. The reference for it lives for the life of the program. Um, string literals in Rust. Uh, so if you just say let foo equal Damien as the string, uh, string ref string literals in Rust are static references to this stir type. Uh, I definitely don't have time to go into the difference between references to stir and the string capital S type in Rust, they are, they're actually different types. Um, and that is a huge source of confusion, but it's beyond the scope of this talk. Um, but essentially this is just to say that you can define that a reference to something must be static. 
and I would also ignore the unsafe part here um, for now. I've heard things about unsafe. How prevalent is it within dependencies and how, uh, how does that impact the, the need to like validate your dependency chain? Um, I would say most, so I don't know, it depends on what, it depends on what dependency you're installing. Um, if it is something that is heavily optimized or that has to do, do any sort of manual um, memory reclamation or you know, um, working with raw pointers, for example, like say uh, if you're using, um, I'm trying to think of an example, uh, you know, if you're doing C FFI, for example, uh, Rust has a pretty strong um, foreign function interface component to it that lets you uh, interface with C. Um, and all C code is unsafe, for example. So if you're using a Rust wrapper around a C library, um, there's, there's of course going to be some unsafe code there. Um, because you can't, like, once you throw the data over the wall to the, to the or pull data from the C side of things, you don't really have any guarantees about it. Um, but generally, I, I mean, from what I've seen, uh, you know, I haven't gone line by line through a lot of the dependencies that I, I tend to use, but unsafe is not, um, it's not that prevalent unless for performance reasons. Um, but there's a sort of, uh, there's a misconception about the keyword, I think. Um, they probably could have chosen a different word. But when you declare something in an unsafe block, um, what you're saying is not necessarily that it's not memory safe, but you're saying that you don't like, hmm, how do I say it? You're saying that you have guaranteed that it's memory safe. So you're telling the compiler, don't memory safe, don't do everything that you do to check this for memory safety. I'm telling you that it's safe. Uh, so it's a, it's a bit of an unfortunate keyword, but really it just means uh, I know what I'm doing, uh, allow, you know, me allow raw pointers, allow manual memory management in this space. It's really what it means. But if um, you get a runtime error, then it's not memory safe, right? It, would it just allow runtime right. errors? Uh, well, th that is something that can happen. So you, it, it's, and that's the reason that they chose unsafe, even though it's a, it's a little bit inverse of, of what you're actually doing is you're, you're saying that you're guaranteeing that it's memory safe. That, that is the, the trade-off is that if, if you write something in an unsafe block, you could do things that would cause the equivalent of a segmentation fault or, or other problems. Um, but generally it's, I mean, it's the practice in the community to not write unsafe um, unless you really have to. Like there, there has to be a good technical trade-off for why you would want to write something in an unsafe code. But I would say it's not that prevalent generally. I'm gonna jump in here as well. I know we're getting close to the end of our time, but were there any Last one or two questions that anybody wants to bring up? Yeah, that, that was really it uh, from, from my side as well. Uh, lifetimes were the last thing. Awesome. So how would you rate the maturity of the, the Rust ecosystem and tool chain right now? And um, do you see like significant improvements or changes like on the horizon? Yeah, so um, so Rust is very stable now. Uh, I was actually chat chatting with a couple of my friends the other day. Uh, 1.0 came out in May 2015. Um, so it's been, it's been out for, for a while. Uh, the one place where Rust is definitely still having a lot of API fluctuation um, is around async await. So um, we didn't talk about multi-threading really at all, but basically um, there are data types in Rust, uh, there's a standard, in the standard library, there are futures. Um, and just like it, it's, it's akin to the model that you see in TypeScript or JavaScript uh, or Python, where you have async, um, async, you declare functions as async, and then you can await, await values on those functions. Um, and there are, what, what's sort of not standardized now around that is like, how should the, the, the task execution model work for that? Um, and should it be, uh, should it be an external library, uh, an external crate, or should it be built into the standard library? Um, so some of the stuff around features and async are changing still. That's, um, that's by design, actually. Um, the core language team, I can try to find it and send it out to folks afterwards, wrote up uh, a pretty good blog post on that design decision to not couple async await to a specific runtime or approach. Um, and they, they have some good use cases and some good examples of how that's allowed the ecosystem to build or adopt uh, different runtimes based on you know, what kind of application you're building, 
you know, CLI versus a web service versus embedded coding or something like that at a high level. So it's not, it's not that it's unsettled per se, that, that that was a core team deliberate choice. I would say at this point, uh, Tokyo is far and away from most general use cases, I think uh, pretty widely adopted as a general runtime. Uh, and maybe where it's less settled is in some of these other use cases. Um, there may be still work ongoing that uh, to produce runtimes that are more suitable. Like uh, again, the embedded working group is pretty active and you could imagine in a resource constrained environment, you might not take the same approach implementing your runtime there as you would on you know, a, a more general purpose system. Yeah, that's a great point. Hey, uh, I, I had a, a point uh, that I thought of when uh, someone was talking about uh, the unsafe block. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I did a talk on reverse engineering and uh, when I was making uh, some examples, like calling C APIs, um, that's when I was actually using the unsafe uh, uh, keyword. And, and I believe other languages like Node.js and stuff, they use the foreign function interface, FFI. But with Rust, I was noticing that if you're, use, if you're calling C APIs or you're calling other types of languages, using unsafe becomes more useful. Um, but I just wanted to add that tidbit. Can you wrap unsafe FFI data in a, in a safe manner? Like can you cast it to, to Rust types? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I'd have to look that up. I don't think you can. I, I'm not sure. I'd have to look that up. Cool. Um, I did have one last question if nobody else had any. I, th I think I have a lot of questions. So if anybody else had questions. Um, I heard really great things about Rust type system. Um, so I think I studied Haskell for three months uh, earlier this year. Um, and you know they have like higher kind of types. I think somebody mentioned in the chat, Thomas, I think you mentioned uh, like lifetimes are kind of like higher kind of types. Um, there's also, you know, like options uh, either, I think. Um, yeah. So Error handling in Rust is heavily inspired by Haskell and other functional languages. So rather than having a uh, null outside of uh, unsafe blocks, yeah, you're, you're dealing with uh, try types and option types uh, and they're, they're straight up monads. So if you understand that concept, then you're not gonna have any trouble with error handling in Rust. Are there other features of the Rust type system that, that particularly stand out? So one, th one thing that I think is really powerful um, it does have a very good um, and somewhat hygienic macro system, which is useful for sort of having um, very attic functions that work on different types of data. Uh, and then there's something called procedural macros, which sort of let you really extend the language almost um, and operate on token streams of, of Rust code, which is really cool. Um, but one thing that I think is really, really powerful in Rust is um, the trait system. The trait system is heavily inspired by Haskell type classes. Um, and what it lets you do is if you think of a Java interface or a Go interface, you're describing the behavior of a particular type without describing its shape or its features. Um, in Rust, you can do this as well, um, but you can very explicitly bound um, amongst different traits and you can combine them and you can say that a particular function, for example, uh, or sorry, a particular data type um, is only able to be used in this particular function if it matches all these traits and they have and those data types have these other traits and it's super super useful because you can basically just tell the compiler exactly how a piece of data sort of moves in your program flow um, and you'll be explicitly describing its behavior in such a way that it can't operate like it's it's not possible for it to operate in any other manner um, so the trait system is super, super helpful for writing correct code, I found. So you have things like orderable and enumerable and like things like order, like enumerable inherits from for orderable and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. And it's really powerful because you can define custom traits that allow you to transform type A to type B in a, in a type and memory safe manner. Um, and it just, it just ends up being really helpful. Um, so you sort of take all these things into one umbrella and you say, okay, well, the, the scoping is really enforced. The type system is really enforced. And then the type behaviors on those types are also really enforced. The sort of net effect 
is even though it's a different mental model, um, I've like once you write, it's a little bit like Haskell. Like once you write a piece of code that correctly compiles and runs, you can be super, super sure that you're not going to get runtime errors. Like, of course, you know, leaving data validation outside the scope of it, but it's, it's really helpful for writing correct code. Um, and that's and in the sort of experiments that I've done at work with it, it saved me a ton of time, especially when it's like a, a project that um, I'm working on myself uh, that has to run at a particular scale. Um, it's just really helpful uh, to be able to organize the, um, the program that way.